Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello, good afternoon to you. Uh, the Rebels is what they've jokingly called themselves. An unholy trinity is what Nigel Farage thinks of them. The three people in question are Nick Clegg, Ken Clark, and Lord Adonis, Andrew Adonis, three of Britain's uh, most vocal Europhile politicians. They've been accused of trying to undermine Brexit after meeting um, with Michel Barnier, the European Union's chief Brexit negotiator. Um, we've had the three Brexiteers, haven't we? Uh, Michael Gove, Boris Johnson and Liam Fox. And now we have uh, Clegg, Clark and Adonis. They say uh, going to Brussels to meet Michel Barnier and others simply to get a better understanding of the situation. That's how Nick Clegg described it. Um, we're here to talk about cricket, said Mr Clark, which I doubt very much. Uh, but he confirmed on the way in that it was the first time uh, the trio had ever attended a meeting together. Uh, so there's some kind of meaning in their quotes, madness, isn't there, in this. Um, y you would expect Nigel Farage uh, to respond the way that he did. And, and, and to be fair, when, when uh, Jeremy Corbyn went to Europe, when the summit was taking place, which he'd done before, but it was a very important summit, very um, scru heavily scrutinised summit, wasn't it, a few weeks ago in Brussels, um, he was criticised for doing the same, undermining the government, undermining the Brexit negotiations with the claims railed against him. Um, what do you make of these three, Nick Clegg, Ken Clark and Lord Adonis, going to Brussels independently of anyone, of, of anyone or anything, and uh, just finding out what is going on in the negotiations? Uh, Michel Barnier is being accused by holding these meetings of attempting to divide and rule over Britain in these negotiations. Do you think they have uh, every right to do what they're doing? Or do you wish that they would butt out? 0345 6060 the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. We'll get the very latest at 3.30 uh, from Catalonia um, later on this hour. First, though, Jared Batten joins me, UKIP MEP for London and the party's spokesman on Brexit. Good afternoon to you. Hello, good afternoon, Sheila. Just the man on this topic. Uh, how do you characterise what they're doing? I think they're a gaggle of quizlings. They're undermining their own government. They are arch remainers who just won't give up. I mean, Clegg lost his seat to a fairly unknown Labour candidate, so it probably showed the verdict of his own voters. Um, uh, Lord Adonis, of course, is, is a lord. He's not even elected. Ken Clark's an MEP. He's not a minister. And they are what they're doing is treacherous. To go over and talk to a foreign power why the government is trying to negotiate them is nothing short of treason. Uh, they are despicable. Well, you, you use the word quizzling. If for people who don't know what that means, it's a traitor who collaborates with an enemy force occupying their country. So they're not that, are they? Uh, it's a good analogy. We, we, you know, why? We, we, it, it was a deliberately offensive one, is it not? Uh, well, I find it offensive that they've gone over there to undermine their own government when their own government, who isn't very keen on doing it anyway, uh, is trying to uh, negotiate our way out of the European Union. And for them to go there and hold talks with what is essentially a foreign power to tell them basically how to undermine it, to delay it and impede it, which is exactly what they're doing, or, and to end up with an agreement whereby we don't really leave anyway, um, that is giving succour to you know uh, our opponents in this debate. And that's, uh, in my view, a very... A uh, despicable thing for them to do as, a, as well. One of them's elected politician; the other two yeah, aren't. The thing is, though, you, you know, you're a politician. Behind the scenes, and sometimes <laughs> on stage as well, but behind the scenes, political people—not just elected people, but political people—always meet and discuss ideas and have meetings. And why? Why is Brexit particularly different to anything else? Politicians often travel and and exchange ideas and find out about nation states and find out about the the latest on a particular situation. Why? Not this. If you, under the American Constitution, if you treat with a foreign power, it's actually treason. Well, we don't have that law, but they have that law so that if their own government is in having, uh, you know, some kind of diplomatic or relations or otherwise with another power and you go over and talk to them, you'd actually be guilty of treason. And these people, are, this is not just having a general chat about how things should Well, well we don't know. You weren't in the room. I wasn't, you weren't. Well, 
I don't think they really went there to talk about cricket. No, I don't either, and I think Ken Clark was clearly joking, but they went there to find out what's going on. That's fair enough, isn't it? They 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 can look in the newspapers or look on the internet to find out what's going on. They know what's going on. They have no authority to be involved in what's going on because they're not part of the negotiating team. They're not envoys on behalf of the government in, in any way. So they had no reason to stick their two pennyworth in. Uh, and well, so- if, if Michel Barnier invited me t- to, to a conversation about the Brexit negotiations, and I went, and I would, just so you know, am I a quizzling? Well, you're a journalist, so you're, you can go there and ask questions, and he can ask you perhaps what you think, what your LBC listeners think. But you're not portending to, uh, pretending to represent the British public in any way, which is what I think they're... Uh, they, they don't actually represent... Well, neither is Nick Clegg in particular... Yeah, he doesn't in particular, and even Kenneth Clark has lost his side of the argument in the referendum. So I think it's a different case. I think they're not just going there to have a chat. They're going there to offer advice to the EU about how it can forestall this whole process and in some way make it not happen, or, or, or we can end up with this deal whereby we don't really leave anyway, and if which I, is what I fear the government is doing anyway. And if I tell you that, and I'm sure there'll be some listeners who feel the same, if I tell you I'm quite pleased that, that they're doing that, what do you say to me? Well, uh, you, well, are you a Remainer then? You don't want to I am, yeah. Well, this is the problem that we've got. We've had our entire constitution and political way of life undermined by the cancer of the EU for the last 40 years. We've had a foreign power making laws in our country, and now we've got people like you who prefer to have their laws made in a foreign place than they do in their own democratically elected No, but no, no, no laws. So that's are, why we need to no, get no, out no, and regress in, in, yeah. out. Position or re- restore our position as an independent democratic nation state. But, but no laws are being broken here, are they? This is just this is just you not wanting men who have every right, but people who have every right to be where they are. You just don't want them having the conversation. You want to hog not, the conversation. They're not breaking a law. What they're doing is going over there in order to undermine our government at a pivotal point in our history where we break free from the European Union and they're trying to make sure it doesn't happen. And they're doing that in the face of a democratic decision in a referendum which they will not accept the result of. If, if, um, if we'd have lost this referendum, the, the Leave side, we would have been expected to shut up and go away uh, and they wouldn't be inviting us over to ask us how they could improve the European Union. They'd now be implementing their... Uh, program of full-scale uh, economic and um, and military integration, which, incidentally, the European pu- Parliament published a pamphlet on this last week, which you might like to have a look at. Can I... All the things that we were told weren't happening are now going to happen. And can I just ask you... Um, uh plenty of people in this country, you know, you you talk about the will of the British people, but there are plenty of people in this country concerned about potential job losses after Brexit. I don't know whether they'll come, you don't know whether they'll come, Um, but there are uh, Brexit impact reports that we haven't seen sight nor sound of. Uh, There are estimations uh, of 75,000 jobs being lost from Brexit. I mean, I stress, I don't know that. I'm just saying that, you know, that there are estimations that this is what will happen. And this came from Mark Carney, who tried to undermine the referendum, who should have been sacked after the referendum. And we can trade in in specifically on this he's a man that knows some stuff, Jared Batten. This this specifically about the 75,000 jobs... How come is it it, that New York, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Singapore all manage to trade with the EU by things called rules of equivalence? So they have equivalent rules. So there's no jobs going to be lost. This is all black propaganda put out by people who don't actually want to leave. Bank of England, BBC, they're all at it. They're all trying to undermine the result and try to overturn it. In what way is the BBC doing that? Oh, well, do you watch it? Do you watch it? You're relentless. I watch and listen. Of course I do. Well, I've given up, more or less, because I'd switch on. I'd watch the headlines. You can, you can tell the story yourself because you know how they're going to spin it. Channel 4, ITV, they're all the same. Relentless propaganda about, oh, the job losses. Let me tell you when we leave. We won't have to pay them billions every year. We can get out of the common agricultural policy. We can have cheaper food. We can get out of the common fisheries policy. We can get our uh, territorial waters back and have a fishing industry, which was destroyed. We can get rid of over-regulation on business and <laughs> actually bring increased prosperity and and you and 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 you don't think that three men who disagree with everything you've just said uh, along with 48 percent of this country you don't think that they have the right to talk to michelle barnier have the right to go along to undermine this country when the when our government is conducting negotiations with this people if they came on your program or they stood up on a platform public platform and said i think this is all a bad idea this is what we should be doing that's fair enough but they're going to a foreign power 
to undermine the government's position, our own democratically elected government's position, with the force of a referendum behind it. And I stand by what I've said about them. OK, Jared Batten, thank, thank you. you uh, me thank me you. My pleasure, always. Uh, Jared Batten, UKIP MEP for London and the party's Brexit spokesman as well. Jared has called from Crewe on this. Hi, Jared. Hello, Sheila. I'm glad you explained what a Quisling was. I'm a thick northern. <laughs> you knew, did you? You knew. <laughs> I knew, but it's nice to explain. To us I think it's important north. because it's not a word that you... It, it, I mean, it was used deliberately for impact, but it's not a word that uh, is used all the time, is it? I don't feel as strongly as that, gentlemen, but I do feel strongly about this. I don't think those three should have been there. I, I think Mr Barnier should have shown them the door and said, sorry, one of you is an, M one of you is an MP for a small town called Nottingham, and the other two, you're not representatives of any constituency. Now, I know they represent your views of the 48%, but I've got a government doing that, in theory. I've got a government I didn't vote for, but it's there representing this country, and it's there representing Brexiteers and Remainers. Now, I'm naive. I don't, I don't believe that they are actually representing me. They're probably representing the one percenters, big business, and themselves. But I like to think the government is doing something for all of us. These three are just doing it for their side and their side only. And they're not going to share the information they get from Mr Barnier with us, not you, Sheila, or me, or the other 48%. They're going to share it with their mates to formulate tactics. Be nice if they did share it, though, wouldn't it? Or, or use it to inform their debate that they want to have and have and are perfectly within their rights to have. I'm not sure they do. I actually do feel a little bit betrayed by them being there. Now you can say again. What about when Jeremy Corbyn went? Did he have every right to be there? I feel less strong about that. I, 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 I'm not so so annoyed about Mr Corbyn. At least he's the leader of a opposition party. And some of his constituents voted Brexit and some of them voted for remaining. Mr Clegg couldn't even beat a dubious young man now. Lord Adonis is an appointed crony who's only interested in building a shiny train up to us in Crewe. And Ken Clark, well, he's got so many non-executive posts that he represents business. So uh, Okie doke, Jared. thank you. Uh, two Jareds so far, Jared Batten of UKIB and Jared of Crewe, think it is an absolute disgrace that these three men have gone to Europe. Nick Clegg, Ken Clark, Lord Adonis, he feels betrayed. Do you feel betrayed? Uh, 0345 6060 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Or like me, do you rather celebrate the fact that these three uh, intelligent individuals from our political life, past and present, have gone over to find out what's going on? on uh, 0345 973 the number to call 16 minutes past three well oh, you're all very annoyed with me about uh, saying that i'm pleased that nick clegg ken clark and lord adonis have gone to have meetings with michelle barney well bite me i'll get to the calls in a moment and you can tell me why you can tell me off you can tell me why i'm wrong 0345 973 before you do that uh, theo washwood lbc's political editor is here just before we talk about the story that you're actually here to talk about on this question of uh, those three men i mentioned going to have talks yeah. with with Michel Barnier, is it different from Jeremy Corbyn doing it? He's, I suppose he's, he's the leader of the opposition, so he has a bit I, more status politically. I think what's different is, uh, and I think this will come, the argument will come from the Labour leader's office, is that Jeremy Corbyn could feasibly see himself in the room negotiating with Michel Barnier. Depending on what happens here. Depending on what happens here. Mm -hmm. And if Theresa May uh, finds herself uh, out of power and there's a subsequent leadership election and uh, and then there's a general election and Labour wins that general election, then Michel Barnier and Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Tusk would suddenly find themselves dealing with Jeremy Corbyn. And so the argument there is, well, actually, there's an interest from both sides to so they can suss each other out. And what Brexiteers are getting so worked up about with Clegg, Clark and Adonis going over is that somehow they the might rebels, be trying they to... They, they don't have any mandate to be there. Uh, they, they could never find themselves involved in those negotiations. But, is it, but a mandate isn't the same as a right, is it? They have every right to speak to whoever they want to speak to, don't they? Oh, yes, I, I'm, I'm putting the other yeah. side of the yeah. arguments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, they Me can too. speak to whoever they like, sorry. <laughs> um, but they don't... <laughs> Um, but they're, they're there just simply to cause trouble and they could never find themselves uh, with a uh, substantive position 
negotiating a particular line on behalf of the British government uh, in Brussels. So Whereas why, Jeremy Corbyn why, why are they there could, just to yeah. cause trouble? And of course it's also fair to say that Jeremy Corbyn came in for a fair amount of stick when he did go over there himself and people were very unhappy with him for, as they would put it, undermining the Prime Minister. But, but in a way, you know, and I'll leave this in a second and come back to it with, it, with the calls in, in a moment. In a way, uh, you know, they have access... They have access that others don't have, absolutely, uh, because of their political experience to date. Um, they are in the mix uh, in different ways in terms of the debate on, on Brexit and the debate on the kind of Brexit we should have. So informing themselves to the hilt is its the responsible thing to do, really, isn't it? Absolutely. And you could also flip this round and look at it from the Europeans' point of view, and that's not what many people do. It's not particularly in vogue. But if you're sitting in Brussels and you're Michel Barnier, it's nice to if you like, split the opposition to create as many strands as possible, to make as many di bring as many dimensions to that negotiation as possible. Mm. Mrs May already has to negotiate with a large, well, two sections within her own party. And then, you enter, and then Jeremy Corbyn enters the fray, and then you've got this other... Uh, new layer. New layer adding in. And that doesn't make Michelle Barnier's job more difficult. It only makes Theresa May's job more difficult. Now, listen, we began this programme, uh, I began this programme talking about the Westminster claims and allegations of sexual harassment. Um, Michael Fallon uh, is all over, uh, ha well, at least two, I think, of the papers today um, with... I say allegations made against him, but they, they've been accepted, apologised for the person in question. My predecessor here, Julie Hartley Brewer, has said, yes, Michael Fallon touched my leg, touched my knee. I told him I'd punch him in the face if he did it again, and that's the end of it as far as I'm concerned. I'm fine. Um, interesting anomaly here, that there's to be no investigation or move, disciplinary move on Michael Fallon in the way that we're seeing in the Conservative Party on, on um, Michel Garnier? No. Mark Garnier. Mark Garnier. Yes, the Trade Minister. It is an interesting development and uh, it brings with it accusations that somehow uh, Theresa May is uh, operating double standards because, of course, uh, Sir Michael Fallon, the Defence Secretary, has already, as you said, apologised to Julia Hartley Brewer after he repeatedly touched her knee during a dinner 15 years ago. But he will not face an investigation from the Cabinet Office unlike Mr Garnier, who's a trade minister, uh, and of course he asked his secretary to visit a sex shop in Soho on his behalf and, and had a couple, well, one nickname particularly, which was uh, offensive, very offensive. The Prime Minister uh, spokesman said, said today that uh, the PM believes uh, Sir Michael was right to apologise, but her, he also refused to say whether the PM has full confidence uh, in the Cabinet Minister. Uh, the line from the spokesman, Sir Michael has been clear he apologised for something that took place in the past. It is right that he apologised in relation to that incident. The Prime Minister has confident, confidence in her government and ministers. So not quite, directly in him? Not directly uh, in, in him. Julia Harley Brewer, for her part, has said uh, that nobody was remotely upset or distressed by the incident and that she calmly and politely explained to Sir Michael that if he did it again, she would punch him uh, in the face. In terms of where this story goes next, and this is quite interesting from a couple of Tories I've been speaking, senior Tories I've been speaking to, is that yesterday the Speaker John Burko stood up in the Commons and he accepted the premise of Theresa May's letter, which that something needs to be done. But in terms of setting up an HR department yeah, for a staff, structure. a grievance structure. But he said that the onus rested with the political parties for doing that, not with Parliament. And of course the Tories are saying Labour already has that structure because of its union affiliation. The could Tories be, don't have it. And then they could be accused in this instance of policing one person but not another. Exactly. And you don't end up with a, what the Tories are saying is they need an overarching system. One doesn't exist. Why can't the Speaker make it happen? OK, thanks very much indeed, Theo. Theo Washwood, LBC's political editor. John has called from Gantz Hill and Linda in Ernston. Uh, John, hello. Hello there. Good uh, day. Um, hello. I just think that it's outrageous. Um, the electorate voted they gave us an instruction the government an instruction they wanted out that's what they said it was simply they wanted out they wanted a bit to be cut off from europe and that is the instruction and anybody that's against that isn't very democratic are they I mean, you, uh, uh, you. I know you're paying, you're 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 making com making a, a program of it. But if you meant to be on one side or the other, I hope you'd be on the democratic side of. Uh 
I am. I am, John. I am. I promise you. And, oh, I, and, and well, let me now, explain. Can I just say one thing. Oh, in, go on. I don't. I'm not. I don't. I'm. I'm sorry for being rude, but um, if there was any definition, it should have been done at the when, when they were programming this and giving it to the people. You're you're going to get a referendum, but. The, the foreign minister was the biggest idiot. Gold was another one. And Ken Clark was in the background not helping anything. Now, they uh, were outrageous. They, 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 they gave no, not even minimal uh, 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 information. They, they were, gave nothing. The election, I agree, the, elec the, the, the election was taken without a lot of knowledge of what it entails. I'm sure that if now it had been taken, it, it would have been a, a more sophisticated decision. Yeah, and actually the that... The population are, aren't idiots. No. And that, but they've made a decision on, on the lack of information that was purposely given by, by the, this government. But that's and why... This government doesn't do anything unless they mean to do it. And they excluded telling us about it. Now, I, 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 on that basis, uh, uh, an instruction has been made by the population of this country democratically. Yeah. That's the word, democratically. And I think when these guys come back from w this comfy chat, we all know what they've gone over there for. They're troublemaking. They're making it hard for, for the Prime Minister. But, John, can I now, ask you a question? They, can, I, can I just say, when they <laughs> yes. come back, they should be held... They should be held for interrogation for a period of about a month to establish exactly what their intentions were and why they did it, and then reprimand. Oh, thanks for your call, John. John in Gants Hill. Thanks very much indeed. Linda has called from Ernston in Trafford and has been waiting patiently uh, to talk about whether Nick Clegg, Ken Clark and Lord Adonis, Andrew Adonis, three of Britain's leading Europhile politicians, uh, political figures, um, should be in Brussels, speaking to Michel Barnier. Should they be, Linda? Yes, I do, actually. I mean, I'm really pleased with them because I think it's about time that somebody actually started speaking up for the 48%. I mean, I do not trust our government. I think from the 80s onwards, they've actually sold this country out to the highest bidder. Most of our top companies have been sold for less than what they were. So our gold reserves have been squandered away. Um, armed forces decimated. Private, private companies in our NHS, in the prison service. I mean, once we get American big business in this country properly, which I think William Fox will do, I do not trust him. Um, and if they get their hands in our NHS, then it's good by NHS. I mean, I don't think people realise what they've actually voted for. I mean, nobody's told the truth about the government. I actually read somewhere that Norway invest in this country for the benefit of their own people. I mean, imagine our government doing that. I don't think they would. Do you... Just sell us ours, you know. You know. I, mean, well, I mean, Tony Blair's government even actually used this country as like a petri dish to force diversity on us. I mean, it's absolutely scandalous what the governments from the 80s onwards have been able to get away with and blame on the European Union. And the European Union have had nothing to do with it. It's governments... You know, Do, I, I think anyway. When, when I, I think, not. when I think it was my first caller, when um, uh, the gentleman who didn't really want me to speak at all, when, when, when he talked about it being a democratic decision, he didn't sound particularly enamoured of Brexit, but he said it's you know a democratic decision has been made and we must stick to it. Um, is that how you see it? Do, do you want Brexit no, to, to, to you? But if Brexit can be a success, you want it to be, do you? I don't think it can be a success, Sheila. I really don't, because we're a tiny country now. We swim it. Well, once we leave the European Union, we'll be swimming with sharks. And everybody knows what sharks do. When they smell blood, they just die. I mean, governments now have turned this country from a manufacturing-based country to a service country. And apparently, you can't sell <laughs> services to Canada. So what are we going to sell to Canada? We don't make anything, really. Um, I'm just really, really angry that nobody's actually pulled up our governments and governments haven't actually had the guts to say to people, well, I'm sorry, folks, but all the problems in this country have actually been with us. We've actually sold you out, but you won't have the courage to do that. So even though they're not, um, well, well, Ken Clark is in, is in Parliament, but even though these, aren't in, these men aren't really in a position to affect negotiations, apparently, anyway, do you believe that they are... A, a really important part of the 48% still being represented. I do. 
I do. I mean, I'm re- I mean, I don't fortunately have any grandchildren, so but I do have a god little godchild. She's six, and my sister's ten, and my other two friends they have children of six and twelve, and I really worry for their future. So, so when I voted Remain, I was actually thinking of their. F- I mean, I'm 66 this um, in you know in a few weeks, so you know I'm a pensioner, and obviously, I mean, I've not got much of a stake in the country now, but I mean. My French children have, and I'm really worried about them, you know. And I think, I mean, I can't, I spoke to my MP a few months ago and I said to her, I cannot believe Parliament actually passed the referendum as it, as David Cameron wanted it to be passed. There was no tolerance level. Normally you have like a 5% tolerance level. Um, we, they're always advisory. Um, a lot of British citizens, our British passport holders were not allowed to vote. It was disgraceful, absolutely appalling. All right. And I do not trust any of our people in government. They're all useless. Well, Linda, thank you. Linda in Ermston, pleased that the rebels, as they've jokingly called themselves, Nick Clegg, Ken Clark and Lord Adonis, are in Brussels or have been in Brussels speaking to Michel Barnier. Plenty of you aren't. Uh, they've uh, got enough to do domestically. If they really wanted the best for our country, they would listen to British people rather than unelected, overpaid, overprivileged, uh, unelected again, bureaucrats. Uh, Roland, the underpaid, underprivileged gardener. Uh, this text uh, disagrees. I hope Brexit collapses, says this text, which I've just momentarily lost. There it is again. I hope Brexit collapses. The referendum has no legal validity. Anyway, Britain has a parliamentary system and not a direct democracy. I gleefully await May to muck up Brexit and we end up not leaving. 52% is hardly a resounding pro-Brexit result. Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain. Let's merge Britain with France and Germany into one... This will drive a few people mad. Britain into France and Germany into one state and under one government. Mm. That ain't going to fly. 03 Four five six zero six zero nine seven three. The number to call. Uh, is it right that Nick Clegg, Ken Clark, and Andrew Adonis, Lord Adonis, are speaking uh, with Michel Barnier, the chief EU negotiator? It's three forty-five. Lee has called from Croydon. Are they right to go to Brussels, Lee? Nick Clegg, Ken Clark, and Lord Adonis. Uh, I think it's quite disgusting. Who's, who's Nick Clegg? I asked the person that answers the phones. Nick Clegg ain't even an MP anymore. So that's like me showing up in Europe. Going, All right, Mr. Barnier. What's happening? You should give it a go, Lee. Why's it taking so long to do a deal? You should give it a go. Who paid for that trip? Who paid for that trip? I don't know. Probably expenses, isn't it? That I'm paying for, that you're paying for, and the British public are paying for. Why? Why? why That's why it's taking so long. Because someone's making money out of it. Someone's being paid to keep going to Europe and keep claiming expenses. Anything we do in this country, we've got to have a big debate. It's got to take a few years. The uh, Chilcot inquiry, how long did that take? No wonder the bloke hung it out. He's on five hundred pound a day. The one Patricia Rodge was it for the new bridge that we was going to have with the flowers. She was on LBC. Mm. I'm going to talk to everyone. I'm, I know I'm going off track, but just listen to the point. I'm going to talk to everyone. I bet you are, love. On five hundred pound a day, so would I. I'll hang it out for as long as possible. But back to the subject, Nick Clegg. Really, he was only deputy prime minister because they had to have a coalition because the Tories couldn't get enough votes. What he actually done when he was in government? He done nothing, and now he's swanning about true. Europe trying to tell him what's happening. Well, it's not true. I mean, he, well, he might, he, well, he might not have done things that you don't like, but he didn't do nothing. Oh no, I will tell you what he done. He appeared on Nick Ferrari's show when that little girl got killed in uh, West Drayton by the uh, Polish wife murderer that managed to go over here because of the free movement. He sat there next to Nick in that studio and just said, "Well, how long did you punish someone for?" I hope you had the balls to phone up that that little girl's parents to say, "Well, how long did you punish someone for?" People have had enough this, in this country of being mugged off. He's the one that's mugged us off the most, and now he's going to Europe to try and... What, what is he actually doing out there? He's not part of the government. He's not part of the people... Yeah, but, yeah, but he is. Yeah, I, well, I, I don't think you need to be part of the government to be part of the debate in the country. Politics has never just been about these 600 or so people that sit in the House of Commons, and nor should it be. Well, can I just show up then? Or hold up, I better. Why, well, why don't you try? Farage over there? Why don't Nigel Farage over there sorting the deal out? He's the one that's led us to this, so why ain't he out there sorting the deal out? Because he's, he's not an MP, is he? He's, he's like, you know, he's not in government. Nor is Nick Clegg. So what the hell is he doing out there? But you're saying, oh, no, it's good that he goes out there. No, he ain't. That's, that's just like any old John showing up. He's nothing. He's not an MP. So they're going, who's this bloke? What's he doing here? Are you, are, you, um, are you a member of what I call the Brexit Bish Bash Bosh Brigade? You think it should be done and dusted in a week? Well, yeah, I can't see why it takes so long. There's just so many lies about it. 
and, and no one wants to listen to that. It's all, oh, that was a lie, that was a lie, on, on the Brexiteer side. But as I said, with this divorce settlement, we was obviously paying a hell of a lot more than the £15 billion that we was told that we was paying. So that figure on the side of the bus was a lie. You're right, it was a lie. It should be double that, because we've been paying about £30 billion a year to the EU. Don't, you, don't people understand it, the people that want to remain? I don't want to build roads in Poland. I, I don't want to make Romania better. I don't want to pay for this in other countries. I want to sort this country out first. We borrow a billion pound a week to keep our heads above water. For 30 weeks of that, we was giving that to the EU. Can I just put it in a little simple analogy for you? It'll mm. only take it 30 seconds. Right. See me like the other day. Look really depressed. What's the matter, John? Oh, well, I've got right, haven't I? Well, what's that then? Had the money to go and get the kids' shoes, didn't I? Right. When I got home, I said to her, I bought next door's kids' shoes, but don't worry about it. I took a payday loan out at 2000 APR, and we can go and buy our kids' shoes. That's what we've been doing for the past 20 Oh, you've thought about that, haven't you, Lee? Uh, thank you for that, uh, Lee's analogy in Croydon. Thank you. Michael in Taunton. Hello there. Uh, hi, Sheila. Yeah, um, that, that guy, <laughs> last caller, he's more clever than I am, and uh, I, it made me chuckle, that last analogy. Yeah, he probably did think about it. And like, unlike the three traitors that went across there, well, they probably did think about it in a despicable way. And, and but why? Um, but I mean, you, you might be angry, but why is it as serious as treason? And somebody called them a quizzling. Well, I wouldn't call them a quizzling, but bordering on traitors, yes, because the government are doing the job. Who do these guys think they are? The absolute arrogance of these men. But they're not negotiating, they're talking. Well, get on a phone and do it, Sheila. They can talk on the phone without going over there and trying to, to conduct secret talks. Um, There's a difference the between private and secret, isn't there? Ah, oh, come on. Well, there is. Come on. Do you think we're not stupid to know they're going over there to cause trouble when there's enough trouble as it is? And, and ma'am, you saying bite me to people who are upset with what they're doing doesn't help the situation either and does not show a lot of maturity either, Sheila. I, I would have thought more of you to say well, uh, like uh, To be maybe. honest, well, I'm sorry if it offended you. I was just having a bit of fun with my listeners saying, come on, then you disagree with me, bite me, and your call's in a second. That, that's yeah. all I was saying. You call it a bit of fun. I call it a lack of maturity, ma'am, and a lack of respect as well for people. All right. Well, I'm sorry you who, see it that way. Yeah. That. Okay. And I think you would be quite good joining along with them, and you probably relish that to cause the trouble as well for our country, oh. sadly. Am I a traitor as well? Well, no, I wouldn't want to, you, you know, I'd leave that to other people to make that judgment of you, but I don't think you help the matter with some of your language that's going along with it. And which which language? Which language? Saying bite, bite me. Just that? Yeah, Any, anything else? Uh, well, no, that's enough for me. Okay, well, that's enough for me. Thank you, Michael. Michael in Taunton. Frank is called from Canterbury. Hello there. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Shirley. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your last two callers. I mean, these, these guys are totally sort of uh, treacherous. It's, it, 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 it's a big word to use, but that's exactly sort of what they are. They've got no rights to be there. And wasn't it Nick Clegg famously said, if we, didn't jo if we didn't join the euro, the country would fall apart? You know, well, there you go. We haven't joined the euro. We haven't fallen apart. They have no rights to be there. And, you know, we have to accept a democratic, um, you know, referendum, which everybody seems to think it wasn't democratic. I voted ironically to stay in. My wife voted to come out. Um, and we got to accept that. You know, people have got to stop. Yourself, James O'Brien, um, you know, you really are not helping the situation. Nobody who's, who's saying... It's not, my job to it's not my job to help the situation. Well, then it's not your job either. I would have thought to sort of hinder the situation. I'm not hindering the situation. I'm having a conversation with people on a radio station about some yeah, well, political I'm, ideas. But, but, but what I'm saying is, when people are, are coming up with this... And, and, and saying things like, well, you know, we're so keen to believe everything that the politicians in Europe say, but we don't want to believe our own politicians. David Davis is a good man, he's an educated man, but we don't want to believe a word he's saying. Well, yes, do, we'll do, you want, Barnier, we'll do you, we'll do you want Barnier, we'll believe Do you want to see the Brexit impact statements or don't you believe them? No, I don't believe a word that comes out of their mouths because they have no interest in... Well, well whose mouths? These aren't mouths, these are reports. I mean, that there are, there are reports being produced... Uh, about what the impact of Brexit looks like being economically in this country. Are you interested in seeing them? Not really, because I don't believe them. I just, I, 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 it's about time we, start, we started realising, obviously... Sort of you don't believe them? What, you don't believe them? What if they say good things? Will you believe them then? 
I don't, as I said, I wouldn't believe anything. I would just believe they were coming out of Europe, and that's what we have to accept, that they were coming out of Europe, and that's it. And people need to realise that. You know, I've got an MP down in Canterbury. I didn't vote for that MP. So can I go back and ask for a rerun of the, of, of, of the election? We're, we're a democratic society, and that's all we've got, you know. And, um, you know, unfortunately, so that the result, I say unfortunately, because I would like this to have stayed in, in Europe, and on, under a different sort of um, and, and setup, system, but, yeah. I did, but I did not vote for any of these. But you want Brexit to be a success, uh, Frank? Thank you uh, in Canterbury, Imran. I'll finish with Imran in Huddersfield because most of our callers have been very. Uh against these three men, uh, Ken Clark, Nick Clegg and Lord Adonis, going to Brussels. But Imran, you're pleased they are. I'm really exasperated. I'm so disappointed in my fellow citizens. We're an intelligent, great, beautiful nation. And I'm just absolutely stunned that people are not listening to reason. People like Professor Stephen Hawking, people from the CBI, self-made, hard-working millionaires who are not on dog tax exiles, are, are, are going are continuously giving us facts, figures, and fact-based information saying that Brexit is going to cost us the economy and it's going to cost the ordinary working man in the street. And James said it earlier on, we've been taken in. Ordinary patients, special needs carers like myself, were taken in. Many of us voted leave because we believe the £350 million to the NHS per week. Yeah, well, uh, that's a whole other day and a whole other conversation. Imran, thank you very much for your call, Imran in Huddersfield. And to all of you for your calls, texts and tweets uh, this hour. Now, just before I hand over to Ian, there is another reason, a good reason to download the LBC iPhone app. There are no bad reasons for downloading it. <laughs> as well as listening to LBC wherever you are, you can now listen back to this and all of our other programmes from the last week for free on our new catch-up feature. Just download the new LBC iPhone app, click on the catch-up at the bottom, uh, on catch-up at the bottom, I should say. It's uh, as simple as that to do. I could barely read it. Leading Britain's conversation at seven is Nigel Farage. I'm sure this is something he'll want to talk about. Well, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Here's Ian Dale. Have you been got at in the last hour by my Brexit friends? Not really, no. Feisty, but that's okay. Someone on Twitter says, Ian, you better come and save Sheila. <laughs> no, I'm all right. I don't okay. need saving. It's Brilliant. fine. It's fine. I'll let you know when I do that. Okay.